All right, welcome everyone to today's webinar, Getting Started with Oral History in Your Community. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by a grant uh, project called Storybox by the good folks over at History Pin um, in partnership with the Digital Public Library of America. Um, so my name is Angela Stanley. I am director of Georgia Home Place with the Georgia Public Library Service. Um, basically, I work with public libraries across the state of Georgia to help them digitize their historical collections for ingest by the Digital Library of Georgia and eventual ingest into the Digital Public Library of America. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Storybox project and then we're going to hand it over to today's presenter. Uh, so as I mentioned previously, the Storybox project uh, is a grant partnership between History Pin, the Digital Public Library of America, and four partner libraries in Louisiana, New Mexico, Georgia, and New York. And I'm speaking on behalf of the Georgia folks and some lessons that we've learned and also hope to um, provide you with some resources for conducting oral histories uh, for just general use. Um, funding for the project was provided by the Knight Foundation. So what is Storybox? Storybox is a civic engagement toolkit for public libraries. It was initially geared towards rural public libraries to get folks into a space uh, of encounter where they would have an opportunity to have conversations um, and to hopefully find some common ground um, around place and storytelling and history. Um, the program uh, has been conducted in pilot sites in the four states that I mentioned. Um, and in, here in Georgia, uh, we are sort of um, trying to combine the civic engagement toolkit with a community digitization layer. So inviting participants to bring in photographs um, or documents uh, that help sort of supplement their stories, but also recording um, some of those uh, conversations that are happening um, in a group setting. So today we're going to discuss um, some best practices and low barriers to entry for quick and easy oral histories and recordings in group uh, situations. I just wanted to show you real quick a couple of photographs of um, some of our events taking place throughout Georgia. So these photographs are from the Marshallville Public Library in uh, middle Georgia, um, taken this past March. All of these folks got together and shared stories about their community. They um, communed over food in their ending celebration and um, have decided as a group to continue the process forward even beyond the duration of the pilot to continue to meet as sort of the community memory keepers, um, which I just think is so great. Um, and this is an event taking place at the Manchester Public Library here in Georgia. Um, also in March. Um, so folks talking with the story prompts, um, discussing um, some of the, the, the things that the prompts uh, laid out for them, but then also adding on as they sort of felt was appropriate. At the end of the program, they're encouraged to record a sort of synopsis of their story on these forms. Um, so you can see that there's space for the participant to write down their story, but also um, include a photograph, um, their name, where they live, um, and some basic details about their story. And so um, we as archivists and librarians and oral historians can use some of the information on this sheet as our uh, metadata fields to help describe any recordings or materials that are included with the story. If you would like some more suggestions or resources um, for the Storybox project or for conducting oral histories, we have created um, a quick uh, resource list at the URL listed on your screen. So you can feel free to go there and pull any of those materials. All right, now on to our speaker for today. Callie Holmes is an oral historian and digital archivist at the Brown Media Archives at the University of Georgia Special Collections here in Athens, Georgia. And she is going to take us through um, her presentation, Getting Started with Oral History in Your Community. I'm just gonna take a second to let Callie go ahead and share her screen.
Great. Um, thanks, Angela. Um, uh, yeah, so what I kind of wanted to talk about today are, um, as Angela said, just sort of how to get started with oral histories. Um, there are a lot of different ways to do oral history. I've done them a lot of different ways um, over my education and career. Um, and um, today I just wanted to talk about sort of some very easy ways and some practical things to think about if you're just getting started with oral history. Um, ooh, can't change my slides, hold on. Okay. Um, so, yeah, just sort of talk about sort of like what the goal for, for goal for this webinar is and sort of what also as part of that, like what the goal is not. Um, there are a lot of really good webinars and guides to doing oral history out there. This one is particularly geared to people who have had experience with Storybox. So have who, people who've had this experience of engaging with their local communities um, who maybe want to try and capture some of these conversations that are happening and they maybe just like don't know where to start just on like a very practical sense um what do, what equipment do you need um what what do you need to just get started with this oral history um one thing where there, there's a lot of things that i'm not going to talk about today um this isn't you know a how to do everything perfectly guide to oral history um, this is a beginner's guide, how to get some things done. Uh, I'm not going to get into, you know, like the nitty gritty of scoping out an entire oral history project. We're not going to talk about, um, I'm not really going to talk about how to do interviewing. I think that's stuff that's covered in a lot of the story box documentation. Um, and also it's covered in a lot of places. So I'm not really going to be talking about, um, you know, ways to formulate questions and that kind of thing. Um, I'm also not going to be talking about video oral histories. I'm really sticking to audio oral histories. Um, video oral histories are great, um, but it's in general, they're more complicated than audio oral histories. So I think for anyone just getting started, I would definitely encourage you to start with audio oral histories. I just, um, they're easier to cap, it's easier to capture a good audio oral history and easier to take care of that audio oral history in the long run. Um, though if you do want to do video, there are a lot of resources out there um, for video oral histories. Um, and so what I have, you know, this is sort of an, an, an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. I've kind of divided this into three parts. Um, things to think about before you do an oral history interview, um, some brief sort of tips about doing the actual oral history, about recording your oral history interview. And then um, finally, what are you going to do after you've completed an oral history? Like, what are some steps you need to take um, to properly care for this recording and share it with the people who are involved in making the recording? Um, but before we sort of get into that, I just want to take a minute to talk about why you might be wanting to do oral history to begin with. Um, I think it's it's something that appeals to a lot of people, and I think that oral history, sort of the standard line that um, you hear a lot is that it fills in the gaps. And I think what this means is that um, history is recorded in a lot of different places, but oral history really takes you to that personal level um, where you hear individuals' stories. And, and a lot of times these are um, individuals whose stories are not captured anywhere else, who may not be part of a bigger written historical record. Um, so it's really powerful to be able to do an oral history to bring those sort of mini histories um, into into the light. Um, and also it's a great way to engage with your local community. Um, I'm assuming most people watching this um, webinar are involved in these community events in some way. And um, having having oral history as a tool to get people from your community to come in and talk about things. Um, it, it's just a really great tool for community engagement. Um, so we'll go ahead and get jump in with getting started. Um, one thing I wanted to go ahead and, and talk about immediately is, um, you know, who are you going to interview? And um, this, what I mean by this is like thinking about the actual setting of the interview. Um, 
most oral history interviews tend to be one person interviewing one other person. Um, however, I think particularly for things that may be growing out of the Storybox program, um, there's, all, there's a lot of times there's a draw where you want to collect um, a multi-person interview where you have maybe a group of friends who went to the same high school that's no longer exists and have them talking about like their memories of going to this school. Um, it's a really common, um, I don't want to say problem, but it's like a desire to capture these multi-person interviews. And I think it's just something to think about from the outset because um, in terms of recording your actual oral history, it's much more difficult to capture a good quality recording of a multi-person interview. Um, and I'm, when I say good quality, I'm not being like very picky. I, what I really mean is like, you may actually not be able to hear people talk. Um, it's just the, the sheer nature of the technology of having usually just one microphone and you have, if you have people spread around a room, you're just not really going to be able to hear everyone's voice. Now it might still be worth it to you to try and capture that group dynamic. And that is totally valid, but you just want to like know from the outset that this is not, this may not be, this may not sound great. And there may be things you cannot hear on your recording. Um, I do think in general, it's better to try and limit it to one or two interviewees. Um, it's just easier to listen to. It's easier to capture a good recording. Um, and, and, you, and if you think about, if you think about listening to an audio oral history, um, it's much more easier as a, for a listener to distinguish between who's talking, if it's just one or two people versus a whole room full of people trying to keep track of who's saying what can be difficult. Um, another thing, a big thing to think about in the beginning is where will you be recording? Um, sometimes you don't really have any choice in this and that's totally fine. You just work in whatever situation you have. But if you do have a choice, um, these are just some things to think about. Um, some more quiet and that sounds pretty obvious, but um, think about like if you do have a choice of rooms, say like in a library building, are there some rooms that are farther away from, you know, like the beeping of scanners of people checking out books or farther away from like a busy hallway. If, if you, if you do have a choice in the matter, try and get a more isolated location um, just to kind of cut down on that ambient noise. that will make you have a better quality recording. Uh, make sure you have electrical outlets. You're probably going to, going to want to plug in something. And um, yeah, if you're in an older building, who knows where electrical outlets are going to be. And so just, that's a, definite thing to keep in mind. That's pretty much the first thing I do when I go into a room for an oral history is look for the electrical outlets. Um, make sure that you choose somewhere that your interviewees can get to, somewhere easily accessible. There are people with mobility, if you have people with mobility issues, you don't want to choose um, a room on the third floor where they have to walk or, you know, it takes them a long time to get there. Or you don't want, you want to choose somewhere where you have parking, where people can park easily if they're people who are going to be driving to the interview. Um, just, just keep in mind making it easy for the people you're interviewing to get to where they're going and that they can figure out where they're going. If this is sort of a complicated room system, then you just want to make sure people know where they're coming. Um, having access to a restroom. Also, you're dealing with humans, so make sure you have restrooms close by, or you can tell them where the nearest restroom is. Um, smaller rooms versus larger rooms, you're just going to get a better quality sound recording in a smaller room. Uh, larger rooms have sort of the echo and ambient noise going on, um, whereas a smaller room will kind of keep that closer. And um, loud fans and HVAC systems, once again, I know that these things are super hard to avoid sometimes. Um, so I, you know, I've done many oral histories where you can hear an HVAC system in the background. Um, it's totally fine if that happens. It's just, if you have a choice, um, like if you can, you know, cut off the fan for an hour while you're doing an interview, that can be really useful and can make you have a better quality recording in the end. Um, I think a one big question that a lot of people um, one of the first questions they ask themselves is, you know, what kind of recorder do I need? What should I, sometimes you're going out and trying to buy something. Um, you may already have something in your library. Um, 
sometimes I think like the best advice if you're trying to do oral histories on a low budget is, you know, someone once told me that the best, the best um, camera to have is like the one you already have because that's the one you end up using. Um, and I think if you already have an audio recorder that you know how to use, then that's the one you should use. You don't definitely don't have to go out and buy something. Um, you can, you know, as I say here, if you have zero dollars, if you have a smartphone, you can record audio recordings on your smartphone. Um, I have an iPhone and I have used the voice memos app many times to record um, little snippets of things like that. Um, there are, you know, obviously some limitations with recording with something like an iPhone. You're, you may not have enough space on your phone to make a very long recording. It's the, the microphone where that picks up the recording on an iPhone is not going to be that great, but it'll be, it's, it, it, it can capture if you were just doing a two person oral history interview and you put an iPhone between you in the middle of the table, then you're going to be able to hear that recording. It'll be a totally fine quality recording. So I just want to say like, don't let technology be a barrier to this. Um, see if you, if you have a laptop computer somewhere, sometimes laptops have the same kind of technology where you can press record and record through the internal microphone of a laptop. Um, so you can use things that you might already have. Um, if you do have some money to spend, one of one what I think the the most popular one of the most popular audio recorders and one that I would definitely recommend is called the Zoom H1. Um, you can get them on Amazon or lots of places online, or, or probably even locally, depending on what stores you have. Um, it's about a hundred dollars, um, which, you know, I, it, everybody has a different budget, but, uh, they're, they're pretty easy to use. Um, it's not, not I don't think any audio recorder ever looks that easy to use at first because they all have at least five buttons on them. And you're like, how can there be five buttons when it's just record, stop and play? Um, but the Zoom has a, a really good track record. It captures a good quality sound and it lets you capture sort of a higher quality audio file, which is something I'll get into a little bit later, like the actual quality quality of like the technical quality of the audio file. Um, one good feature if you're looking at recording equipment is the Ask Doug feature on the oral history in the digital age website. Um, it's this sort of interactive little thing where you can say, you know, what you're looking for, what your price range is, if you're looking for, for professional quality, if you're looking for something for a class project, um, and you can type, you can put in your criteria and it will tell you like what, um, what recorder might suit your purposes. And this is, this is something that Doug Boyd, who does oral history at the University of Kentucky put together. Um, so it, it's, that can be really useful, but really I think the main thing when you're thinking about recording equipment is just to know how to use the equipment you have. Um, it, it doesn't matter how fancy or not fancy it is, but know how to use it. Um, what else do you need besides a recorder, besides something to actual, actually capture the audio file? Well, one big thing you'll probably need if you, so sort of assuming you're not using an iPhone, most recorders will use an SD card, which is just a small, about the size of a postage stamp, um, a small little card that fits into the recorder. And that's where the audio file is saved. Um, SD cards come in a lot of different sizes, which means you may be able to record a 30 minute oral history, or you may be able to record a four hour oral history or even more or even less. So you just kind of want to look at um, what size of SD card you have or what size of SD card you're buying to know, um, you know, if you want to record 10 hour long oral histories, you're going to want a larger SD card. And this is the kind of this information about how long of a recording it will hold. Um, that will be on the packaging for your recorder in the, or on the SD card. So that's something you can, you can figure out. Um, another thing I just want to bring up because I know this is definitely a pitfall <laughs> that happens to a lot of people. Um, a lot of audio recorders um, have an option to record to internal storage. So instead of recording on that little black postage stamp sized SD card that pops in and out of the recorder, um, it records to some sort of memory chip in the actual recorder itself. 
Now, the thing about that is those internal storage spaces are usually very tiny. Like you may get like 30 minutes, an hour that will fit there, which maybe you have a short interview you're trying to record and that's fine. But more often than not, you're going to need more time than that internal storage will be able to hold. So this is a setting I would definitely recommend looking for when you get a recorder. Um, is this recording to an internal storage or is this recording to external storage like an SD card? Um, look to see if that's a setting and make sure you know how to change it. And I would say um, check that setting every single time you sit down to do an oral history interview um, because you never know what may get switched back to some sort of default when you turn off the recorder or if someone else has used the recorder in the meantime. So always check that. Um, another hugely important thing is batteries or some other power source, power cables. Um, there are some recorders where there's some, there's sometimes a debate between, um, should you use batteries, battery power, or should you plug an um, recorder in? And what this is referring to is sometimes there's a little tiny hum that comes onto a recording from the electrical current coming from an outlet into the recorder. Um, usually this, this, is, this doesn't always happen and it's something you can just test. Just plug your recorder in, make a recording, like a quote unquote silent recording and then listen to it. And if you have sort of a, like a low electronic-y sounding hum, then you might want to use battery power because you, you'll be able to avoid that. Um, and if you are using batteries, and even if you're not planning on using batteries, always have a, a bunch of batteries with you. Uh, you may have accidentally picked up dead batteries instead of the new pack of batteries and you need more than you think, or you may think you have electrical outlets and then you get in and that outlet was dead. Um, so definitely be prepared in terms of batteries. Just bring all the batteries with you. Um, I just listed microphones here just to say, I don't think microphones are necessary. Um, they're great to have and will definitely enhance your recording, but keeping with this idea that this is meant to be sort of like low budget, um, low barrier to entry oral history recording. I don't think microphones are something you should worry about having. Um, and if you do want to have them there, are, there, are, like I said, this goes for pretty much everything in this webinar. There are a lot of guides out there that can help you figure out what you might need for your recorder. Um, and then I just want to mention photography. I think it's always good to have pictures of your oral history. Um, taking place. Um, you know, Angela had those great pictures earlier from the events that were held around Georgia. You just never really know when you're going to need a picture of something. Um, and especially for oral history interviews, an audio oral history interview, it's really nice to be able to see a picture of the person talking. Um, and it's a great way to sort of supplement your oral history. And you don't have to have a fancy camera from this. You can definitely just do this with your smartphone and it'll be totally fine smartphones take great pictures these days. Um, but most importantly, before you get started with your oral history interview, you really need to practice with your recorder. Really get comfortable um, using, using your recorder. Make sure you know how to start your recording, stop your recording, pause your recording. Um, I also just wanted to uh, sort of explain the difference between stopping and pausing a recording because this is going to come up later when I talk about editing your file. A lot of recorders will have a start, stop, and pause feature. And um, the difference between stopping and pausing is when you click stop, that means one audio file will end and it will start a new audio file. So when you go to get those audio recordings off of your recorder, you're gonna have file one, file two, however many times you click stop. Um, so if you're doing a recording and someone just needs to, you know, leave to go to the restroom or go blow their nose, just take a break in the recording, you can use pause instead, and that will allow you to keep recording in the same continuous audio file. So if you click pause, someone leaves for five minutes, comes back, and then you unpause it, you click record again, um, you'll only end up with one audio file at the end. And keeping it simple, where you won't, where, where you, if you, I think the goal should always be try and have one file per recording, because when you get into having multiple files, um, you're just gonna have to edit things together and it just makes things a little bit more complicated down the road. Um, 
one, a good question to figure out before you start recording is, does your recorder capture audio in multiple formats? Um, these are these are types of audio files. Um, the pretty the most common types that if you buy an, a specific audio recorder, it will usually have two options: a WAV file or an MP3 file. Um, and the WAV file is just a higher quality, uncompressed audio file. Whereas the MP3, I mean, you, you, I feel like you hear about MP3s more often. These are, you know, the things that are that you download from the internet usually, or um, they're they're just a, a smaller file that's just a lower quality version. And and actually, if you listen to the same file, if it's a good quality MP3 versus a WAV file to your ear, they probably sound pretty similar. Um, but if you have the choice, choose the WAV file. It's going to be better for preserving this file in the long term. They still don't take up that, they take up more space in terms of storage, but they don't take up that much more space. Um, but it's really worth it in the long run to have that WAV file. Um, and I mentioned M4A because that is, it's another type of compressed audio file. And that's what you would, um, if you do use something like an iPhone, that's probably what it would record in. Um, and specifically, if you if you can change the type of WAV file, a 44 kilohertz 16 bit WAV file, we're not at all going to get into what that means. But if that's an option on your recorder, that's the option you should choose. Um, another thing to practice is how to get the files off of your recorder. Um, you <laughs> sometimes this is like easier than others. Your recorder may come with a cable and you plug that cable into your computer through a USB port and then you can sort of pull the files off of there just like with a digital camera or something like that. Um, sometimes you actually have to have a card reader. So you take that little SD card out of your recorder and you have to have a separate card reader that will plug into the USB port of your computer. Um, but just figure out how that has to happen. Um, you never know if you're, there may be a reason when you're in this in the space recording an oral history where you may need to get that audio file off of the card or off of the recorder in the moment. And it's good to know how to do that beforehand. And definitely try and do a trial run um, in the actual environment that you're going to be recording in. Just it, the best way to kind of figure out what your particular issues are going to be is to just go and go and try it because you may think you have everything figured out and then you sit down and you realize that um, you do a practice recording and it doesn't record at all and you're not sure why. And so doing a trial run will give you a chance to do some troubleshooting and figure out what went wrong because it's, uh, gosh, so many things, <laughs> not, not to scare you, but just like things always end up going wrong. And the more time you have to practice and do trial runs, um, you just have time to nip those things before they happen. And after, after you figured out how to use your recorder, how to, um, you know, you have your camera with you, um, now you're ready to do the audio recording, do the oral history. Um, this is, this, I'm not, like I said, I'm not really going to be getting into um, the specifics of what you should, um, you know, how to ask questions or steer a conversation. But I just wanted to give some like things that have helped me some just practical tips. Um, so, you know, what to bring with you when you're doing a recording, um, a release form. Release forms are hugely important. Um, I think there may already be a release form that's been, um, made for these, the storybook story box kind of project, but, um, you, you'd need a release form. Um, and there's, a, there's release forms can, there, there are multiple kinds of release forms. You may, you probably, they can be built together, but you may need a separate release form for, um, using photographs of someone, um, versus using the audio recording of someone. Um, it's, and it's really important that you sit down with your interviewee beforehand and explain to them what's in the release form. Are you saying that you can use this recording for whatever purposes you want to um, forever? Um, let them know that. Are you saying you're going to put this um, recording online? Um, are you saying that you have the permission to use their picture to put on your website to promote your project? You just really want to be clear with the interviewee what, what they're signing when they sign the release form. Um, 
So you need your release forms. You need pins to sign the release forms. I uh, wouldn't have this on the slide if that had not happened to me before. Um, you want to have paper to take notes on. Um, sometimes you just don't have a chance to take notes, but always be prepared, have a notepad with you. You obviously want your recorder and gear, your power cables, your extra batteries, extra SD cards if possible. And I should mention, you can usually get pretty um, inexpensive SD cards. So it's worth it to have an, more than you think you need if you have, if you're able to. Um, I also think it's really nice to have water bottles for interviewees. People uh, tend to get kind of parched when they're talking. So if you can remember to bring a few water bottles, that's always appreciated. And then you need something to keep time with. Um, so a lot of times recorders will have a little internal clock or ticker thing so you can see how long the recording has been. But if you have to put that recorder over in the middle of the table where you can't see it, uh, that doesn't really do you much good, which is what usually happens. Um, I think it's really not, if you, if you can have like a watch or sort of discreet way to keep track of the time, I think that's probably the ideal way to do it. Um, sometimes I think sort of, I use my iPhone to, you know, tell time all the time, um, especially if I don't have my watch on, but sometimes it can be a little distracting in the middle of an interview to sort of pull up an iPhone and, and look at it. So just think about having something where, you know, okay, uh, we're at about the 45 minute mark and I have somebody else coming in in five minutes. So I need to sort of wrap this thing up. Um, when you actually sit down to do the interview, um, I would suggest sign the release form first before you ever get started. Um, you, you may, your inclination may be to sort of wait till the end and have that be part of the wrap up session. But I actually think um, it's, it's, it's much better to do that at the beginning because that gives you a chance to go over the things I was saying earlier where you're telling people, hey, we're going to record this and I'm going to put this online. So keep that in mind when you're telling your story about something, you know, maybe maybe if you have something that does not, that you do not want, um, that you don't want online, then let, it's better not to talk about that in this recording. Um, you want to get people as physically close to the recorder as possible. Um, if you have external microphones, this is not a big deal, but um, you probably won't have external microphones, which means the closer people's voices are to the audio recorder, you know, the, the better signal you'll get, the better quality audio file you'll get. Um, so you've sat down, you've signed the release form. Um, the first thing you should do after you press record is to do what what we call like a slate, an audio slate for the interview. And, you know, that's sort of like the things you see in when people are filming a movie or TV show where they clack the little thing down at the beginning. You basically want to say what your name is, what the date is, where you're recording, and who you're talking to. And this is sort of, you know, the crucial information so that if you create this recording and, you know, you probably have this written down on a paper or a form somewhere, but if for whatever reason that recording gets separated from that form, you want somebody to be able to play the recording and figure out what is on that recording. So the introduction that you do is, is, is really important. And get every speaker to introduce themselves at the beginning of the recording um, in their own voice so that um, this is crucial for multi-person interviews, but you, I think you should do it even if it's just you interviewing someone else. Um, I get, get someone to say, you know, I'm Callie Holmes so that someone listening to it will, can mentally connect that voice to that name and know that, okay, that that's who's speaking now. And it can be a little bit tedious uh, if you have a lot of people in a room, um, I've done an oral, his, an audio oral history before where it was eight people and it, it kind of does feel a little bit silly to go around the room and make everyone say their name sometimes, but it's, it's definitely worth it when you're, when you're trying to listen to that later. Um, and like I said, I'm not talking about really about specific interviewing techniques, but I think it's good to like, you know, bring with you sort of a list of topics or sort of a loose outline of what you want to talk about or a list of questions you're planning on asking. Um, when you're in the moment doing an interview, it can be easy to sort of lose your train of thought or sort of get caught up in going one direction with a story, um, which may be exactly what you want to do. And it didn't matter that you stick to your original plan anyway. Um, but it's good to have something you can refer back to, to kind of bring things back, back around if you need to. 
Um, you also want to record information about the recording. Um, we sort of talked about this, you know, with the audio slate that you're going to speak at the beginning of the recording, but um, you want to have your metadata in a written document somewhere, maybe a spreadsheet, maybe just written on a notepad, maybe in a Word document. But I would say these are the, the crucial thing that you need to have. You need to have the full names of everyone who's speaking, the interviewees, as well as whoever's doing the interviewing. You want to have the date the recording was made. You want to have the location of the recording. And you need to have some sort of contact information for the interviewee. Um, and that's not really something that is usually made public, but you want to be able to get in touch with the interviewee if you need to. Um, so make sure you have some way to do that. And, you know, I have in here, it can be phone, email, physical address. It doesn't really matter. It'll be different, you know, for not everybody is going to have an email they can give you, but a lot of people do. So whatever, whatever works for you and for the person. Um, but that's the stuff that you, you know, must have. There's also some metadata that um, is good to have. And that's basically just, you know, what, what, what do you, what did you end up talking about, talking about in your recording? Sort of the, the topics covered and the approximate time code. So if you can keep, you know, a notepad in your lap and you have your timepiece with you and you say, oh, okay, at about 15 minutes, they start talking about, you know, when he joined the Navy. Um, just kind of scribbling down just a few notes will be so helpful when you go back to these recordings later on because you can kind of navigate the recording a little bit easier. It's more, it's easier to sort of write up summaries for what's on there. Um, it's just really useful to have, but not necessary because if you're caught up doing a recording and you just don't have time or it's just not possible to write notes, um, it's not, it's not necessary. It's just nice to have. So you've done your recording, you've captured your recording, everything went great. You had enough batteries. Um, what next? The very first thing you should do is to make another copy of your recording. Um, you want to have at least two copies of your recording in two different physical places. Um, and that can mean a lot of different things and it doesn't really matter. There, um, it could be one copy that you move to your, you know, computer's hard drive. You can put a copy in Google Drive or some other cloud storage service. Um, you could have two different external hard drives and keep one on one hard drive, one on the other. Um, any combination of this, it doesn't really matter, but you just want to have two copies somewhere because if, if that's the day that your laptop decides it's going to kick the bucket and die, you don't want the oral history to go with it. So if you have another copy on an external hard drive, then you're, you're good to go. But if that's the only place you have it, uh, then you're just out of luck. So there's no way, <laughs> you know, there's no way to get it back. So this is why I say the very first thing you should do is to make another copy of your recording. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about file naming. So, um, the, re the recording is going to come off of your recorder with some sort of generic file name, you know, um, probably just like a string of letters and numbers. Sometimes they're named by like the date. Um, but it, it's really useful, especially for managing and keeping track of these, these recordings later to give your file um, a more useful file name. Um, and I kind of put some examples in this slide. It, it really doesn't matter what you do. If you have, if you only have one interviewee, then it's pretty, I think the obvious thing to do would be to name the file after that interviewee. Um, but if you have seven people in a room, I don't think it makes much sense to put seven different names in a file name. That's just going to be the longest file name. So just come up with something that kind of works. It could just be the date. Um, if you do have multiple parts to an interview, notate that somehow. But going in and giving these things sort of a human, something that will make sense to humans and eyes where you can look at it and kind of get an idea of what this recording is. It's just going to make it a lot easier to manage these files um, down the road. And editing your files. Um, I kind of touched on this a little bit, but basically you want to avoid editing if at all possible. And you're probably going to have to do some editing. But if you just keep in the back of your mind that your goal is to not do any editing and so to take steps when you're doing your recording towards that goal, uh, you'll be a lot better off in the end. Um, 
and the reason I say you don't want to do editing is because you just sort of get into comp it, it's more work that you have to do to manage the files but you also kind of get, get yourself into kind of complicated scenarios where you don't really know which version of a file is the final version um, I think a common thing that happens is um, you know, someone's talking in an interview and they say something and then after the interview's over, they say, you know, I really wish I hadn't said that about so-and-so. Can you please take that out of the recording? Um, and you, you should definitely honor the interviewee's wishes in that case. But when you have to go back and do that editing, um, you get yourself into a scenario where you have to destroy that part of an audio file and then um, if you're not careful, then maybe you accidentally keep your second copy of it, still has the bit that that person didn't want said in it. And so you need to make, you don't know which file is like the real version where stuff has been deleted. It can just get very thorny very quickly. So if you, um, if your goal is to not really, if your goal is to avoid editing, um, I mean, the scenario I gave, it's not really your choice if the person wants to take part of it out, but there are things you can do, you know, like using the pause feature so that your recording is not broken into two different pieces. That kind of thing can help save you time because then you don't have to join together two different audio files in the end. Um, if you do have to do editing, Audacity is probably the most common. It's a um, software. It's a free audio editing software. Um, it's it's pretty easy to use, I would say, but I do a lot of this stuff. <laughs> um, but even for people who don't do a lot of like audio and video editing, it's, it's not a super complicated program. And the good thing is there are a lot of guides online. So um, it, if it's something you can look at tutorials to figure out how to edit your files and you're, you're usually not going to be doing more complex editing anyway. It's not like you're mastering an album or anything. Um, Make sure you have a backup before you do any editing. So if you do accidentally delete half the file, you'll have something to go back to. But you've probably, that was the first thing you did is make your backup, so that shouldn't be a problem. Um, this is, are you going to transcribe? So after you have an audio recording, this is, what this pretty much always comes up with oral history interviews. Transcription is fantastic because you can do keyword searches and find who talked about, you know, such and such river and what interview. Um, but transcription and transcription can help, you know, you may have people who um, cannot hear for whatever reason, and then transcription can make that recording more accessible. Um, but transcription is also very, very time consuming and can be very expensive to pay people to do it for you. So um, unfortunately, um, you know, there's always like the great hope of just using computers and machines to generate transcripts. Um, and they can to some degree, but they're not super accurate yet. And I would say they're especially not accurate when you don't have very high quality sound recordings. And if you have um, multiple speakers and if you have speakers who have accents, um, it's just, it's not really going to work for you. Um, and these are probably things that come up and they come up a lot in oral histories. So that's why the machine generated transcripts are just really not there for oral histories yet. Um, I have used, I was just going to put this in here. I've used this online transcription company, rev.com and they charge a dollar a minute. And, and I've, and I've gotten really good quality transcripts back from them. They sort of like subcontract with people who are, you know, are working all around the world really. Um, but that being said, whenever, when I've tried to do more complex recordings, the quality of the transcript is just, it, it's just harder to do. Um, sometimes if you have people who are using a lot of, um, if they're using a lot of names of people and a lot of like local names of like places or schools or whatever, you know, somebody who's transcribing this, you know, halfway around the world may not be able to figure out what that person's saying as well as you can, because you know that they're, you know, the context and you might know the person they're talking about. So that's also something to keep in mind when transcribing oral history interviews. Um, you might want to see if you have volunteers who, you know, people who are invested in the project that could even be the person who was part of the interview, part of the interview. Um, they may want to help transcribe it. So, um, those are just kind of ways to help try and get transcription done. Um, but I would say for like an inexperienced transcriber, it would, it's probably going to take between four and eight hours of work to transcribe one hour of an audio interview. So it's just know that going into it. Um, 
if you, you, you may, transcripts may be very important to you, um, but don't promise that you're going to have them the next day unless you're going to stay up all night and finish transcribing it. Um, and also, I just wanted to say that transcription can be very complicated. It's sort of a fraught, um, it's the way, the way we have represented the spoken word in text historically um, has been sort of, has been very, it's, it can be very political. You know, if somebody says, if somebody is a poor person and says Ghana and people transcribe it G-O-N-N-A, but if it's a richer person, they would transcribe that as going to, even if people are saying, or somebody says liquor and they would transcribe it L-I-K-K-E-R versus L-I-Q-U-O-R. Um, there's just a lot of things that have happened historically um, that it's just kind of good to keep in mind when you're doing this because it, it's just not as black and white as you may think to try and translate spoken word into text. Um, a guide I often go to is the Baylor Institute for Oral Histories Transcribing Style Guide. Um, I think they have really good um, just sort of guidelines and then they also kind of address specific questions like should you include ums and uhs and other filler words in a transcript and you know and on the one hand it does accurately reflect what was being said but on the other hand it can be really difficult to read a transcript where every three words there's an uh written in between it providing access to your recording um there, this is probably something you want to do because this is probably why, why you wanted to record an oral history in the first place, um, is so that other people can listen to it. Um, there's not, there's not like a perfect, easy, cheap, free way to provide access, but there are a lot of options that you have. Um, I think it's always worth looking into if there's an institution you can partner with for storage and access. This may be part of the, um, you know, I'm here in Georgia, part of, you know, like the Digital Library of Georgia DPLA line. Um, that, that could be a good option for you. If your institution doesn't have anything like that, see if there's someone else you have a partnership with or can form a partnership with who might have more resources. But if you can't, um, there are some free options. There's SoundCloud, which is um, sort of like the YouTube, but for audio. It's all audio files. And um, the, the main drawback of SoundCloud is that the free version, um, you can only upload three hours of content. So if you only have one or two oral histories, that might be fine, but you're probably going to, if you're, if you are actively out there recording oral histories, you're going to hit that three hour content limit pretty quickly. Um, YouTube is totally free. Um, it's also YouTube. So like your recording is going to show up beside a cat playing a piano or whatever. You, you can't control that. Um, which may not be like what you want to have happen. Um, but we, we use YouTube here. So, um, you know, I'm a fan actually. Um, I will say that before you can upload an audio recording to YouTube, you have to record it to, uh, you have to, um, turn it into a video format because YouTube is strictly videos technically. However, um, it's, it's pretty easy to do. There are a bunch of online, if you just, you know, Google, turning an MP, turning an audio file into a video for YouTube. You'll get lots of good free things online where you can just upload your file and they'll give you the, then you can download the, the video version and it'll usually just be like a black screen with your audio file playing in the background. Um, I just wanted to mention that YouTube does do automated voice recognition captioning for files, um, but it's pretty much a hot mess. So don't count on that. Um, Vimeo is another good option. Vimeo is really sort of like a more polished YouTube. Um, it, it's less likely that your video is going to be up there besides all of the random weirdness of the YouTube internet. Um, but once again, the free account is limited by file size. And I actually, I can't remember the exact limit for Vimeo, but I actually think it might be even shorter than the SoundCloud limit. So if you're really, if you're going to use SoundCloud or Vimeo, you're probably going to end up needing to pay for an account, which they're pretty, I mean, it, it's all relative, but they're, they're not wildly expensive. Um, I was just looking up the rates for SoundCloud and it's $7 a month for, um, the sort of intro pay version. 
um, which might be something that you can afford. And Vimeo sort of had similar pricing. But these are ways that if you don't have a partner you can use and you don't have any infrastructure in your library, these are ways that you can put your recordings online so that anyone can listen to them. Um, but you also want to provide access to your recording to the interviewee. Um, this is sort of basic oral history etiquette, is that if somebody has done an interview, you want to give them a copy of their interview so that they can have it. Um, and it's good to let somebody know that when they do an interview, and it's good to also let them know that it may be a couple of weeks before you can get a copy to them so they aren't, you know, calling you every day asking where it is. Um, I put this in here because um, it can actually, <laughs> How you're going to get a copy to the person can be more complicated than you might think. Uh, this is one reason why you want to have the contact information for your interviewee. But um, sometimes, depending if you, like if you have an interviewee who seems you know less technologically invested, they may want um, a, a DVD or a CD. And so you just want to make sure that if that's what the person wants, like if they need a CD, that you have the capability to create a CD because, you know, there are computers being made now that do not have disk drives. So just make sure that if your computer does have a disk drive, there will be some built-in software where you can burn a CD or DVD on your computer. But um, just make sure that you can do that, that you can actually create a CD if that's what somebody wants. Um, but I also think, uh, see if people, uh, oftentimes people go into this with like an assumption that, okay, this is an older person, they're going to want a CD because they're not going to be able to handle like a link to a file on Google Drive. Um, but I would encourage you to ask people because I think that there are more people who can get to things on Google Drive than you might think. And it is a lot easier to share a file via Google Drive than it is to um, buy blank CDs, burn blank CDs, get a physical CD to a person. Um, but like I said, not everybody can handle, just check with your interviewee to see how they want it. Um, but you know, small thumb drives that you can share a file with them or Google Drive, which is free, and you can just upload the audio file. Those are both really good options for getting the recording to the interviewee. Um, and, uh, this is, <laughs> the ethics of oral history is really like probably like five different webinars. Um, so this is really just kind of like a, a high level, like consider the ethics of the situation. Um, when you do oral history interviews, you're sort of responsible for what happens in that oral history interview. And so you want to make sure that everyone's on the same page here. Um, does your did your interviewee talk about any illegal activity um you may <laughs> you may think that's not going to come up but you know i've been in an oral history interview where we're talking about um you know marsh wetlands and that person talks about oh well i you know sort of broke into this office and blah 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 and we were like stop the break you know pump the brakes here um you don't if somebody mentions illegal activity maybe it happened 20 years ago but you know, what are the statutes of limitations? You do not want to be putting your interviewee at risk that someone hears this and, um, and you know, they have some sort of repercussions from that. Um, do, does your interviewee reveal any personally identifiable information? Um, and that can be um, birthdays. Um, it, it's better not to have someone's full birthday on an interview. Um, you just don't want to have things that can kind of compromise them out there. Um, you don't want to be exposing your interviewees to risk. Um, and you want people to understand if you do plan on putting your recordings online, even if you don't have a plan at that moment, like you don't know how you're going to get them online, if that's your ultimate goal, um, you know, treat it as if it is so and make sure that the interviewee knows that their recording is going to be put online and that that means that anyone can listen to this. And that means that um, anyone can. Um, you know, potentially move that file and put it on another website or, you know, once you put something loose on the internet, it's very hard to control. Um, and you just want people, 
I don't, it's not something that needs, that you need to scare them with, but you just make them aware that that's your plan. And this is why I think it's good to have these conversations before you actually do an oral history interview um, to just let people know, you know, this, this isn't, you know, a, a private conversation between two people, really. This is something that's going to be out there online potentially forever and ever. So keep that in mind. Um, and you wait and you may, um, when it comes to restricting recordings, um, this is something that often comes up. Maybe somebody has a recording they want to make. It could be an older person and then they just really want to make sure this gets recorded. But there's something they're talking about that maybe it's related to people who are still alive or maybe for whatever reason, they're just not ready for this recording. Um, to be available right now. Um, that's an option to restrict a recording, but just know that if that's something you're offering people, it can be hard to keep track of that. You know, you don't know how long you might be in the position where you are the person who's the custodian of these interviews. Um, so make sure you document this in a way where the next person who's the custodian of these interviews knows that, Hey, this interview is not supposed to be put online until, you know, 2025 or whatever. Um, and just also know, I mean, hopefully you're not getting, you won't be getting really a uh, deep sort of illegal activity talk on your oral history recordings. But I just want to bring up the fact that, you know, we can say that we can restrict oral history recordings, but we, we can't really necessarily legally do that. If someone wanted to listen to a restricted oral history recording, um, there have been court cases about this that, you know, even, you know, big universities do not have the right to, even if they've told the person, yes, this, this recording is restricted and will no one can listen to it for 50 years. Um, if some court of law wants to get, um, or investigator wants to get a hold of it, then they could. And all of this is just to say, um, don't, don't, don't make promises that you, that you can't keep and really be open and frank with your interviewees about what your plans are and what you're going to do with the recording. So yes, ultimately, be fair and honest. Let them know what's going on. Uh, and finally, I just kind of wanted to put a few resources up there. Um, these are maybe things you've already interacted with. Um, the Oral History Associ Association website obviously has a lot of good resources there. Um, specifically, they have a lot of guides about doing oral history that I put a link to in the slide that's, um, that's pretty, pretty useful. Um, and then Oral History in the Digital Age is a great website. It has not only like practical information, but also essays sort of getting into things like these ethical issues. Um, so uh, that's like a, a really go-to place if you're trying to get more information about doing oral history. And also I would just say um, there are a lot of people in Georgia who are doing oral history well. So, um, you know, ask them questions. And I mean, this is true all over the United States. Um, if you have heard of somebody doing oral histories and you want to get started with this, um, shoot them an email, give them a call. A lot of times oral historians are more than willing to share their trials and tribulations or offer advice, maybe even share equipment with you. Um, so uh, reach out to other people in your network who may have done oral history. Um, I know, you know, here at the University of Georgia, my colleagues in the Russell Library, Christian Lopez and Eva Dimitrova have done a lot of work helping people get started doing oral history projects um, and are always happy to offer advice. And also there are always a lot of webinars and workshops on oral histories, whether these are affiliated with like conferences, a lot of times they're online, um, but it's a pretty popular topic. So if it's something you want to know more about, um, keep your ear to the ground and um, that they usually come, they usually are happening rather frequently. <sighs> and thank you for um, listening to this webinar and um, if you have any questions or if you want more information about something that I've talked about today, uh, please send me an email. Um, I know it's sort of a, I, I think I sort of gloss over a lot of topics um, for the sake of time, but I'm always happy to point you to more resources or point you to someone who does know the answer to these questions. So thank you.